organize this, attendees. We've made it to the last panel of the day. Last but certainly not least, especially for us retail folks in the crowd, I have been a participant in crowdfunding campaigns. We've even done one for security token market. And today we have the pleasure of having, I would say, the leading experts across the Reg CF crowdfunding industry across the board. Uh, you know, So I'm going to go ahead and let everybody get a chance to introduce themselves re real quick. I'm going to start off with, with Laura. I've known Laura for quite some time. She is another brilliant consultant in the space. Now with the Upside team, she knows everything. She should, probably should have been on the real estate panel too. Uh, but man, does she know tokenization as well. So Laura, tell us, what should we know about you? Thank you so much, Herwig, and thank you for having me. I mean, I'm just so grateful to be here and honored and happy birthday, by the way. I know that's a huge deal for you guys. Um, I have been in a little bit about myself. I've been in real estate and development for 20 years. I started my career on the island of Maui. I was selling second, third, fourth homes, a lot of investment product. I niched into luxury pre-construction hotel branded resort real estate. So Ritz-Carlton Residences, Mandarin Oriental, Albert Fairmont, uh, Grand Hyatt. I ended up in a Caribbean on several of those projects. And very long story short, um, 12 projects later, I pivoted into the blockchain space about three years ago. I um, learned and immersed in the space uh, and, and tried to pick up everything I possibly could around the topic. I was fortunate to um, have participated with, um, with, sorry, that, so, um, so I, I was fortunate to participate um, with issuers uh, in an advisory role, working through how to implement AI tokenization into their um, real estate projects. And then um, very, just a few weeks ago, a couple of months ago, almost at this point, I was very fortunate to join the Upside team. And I am thrilled and honored to be part of that team. What they're doing is amazing. Well, I can't wait to dive into that and learn more. But first, we're going to head over to Corey. I've had the pleasure of knowing you for some time. He came to Miami three years ago. If anyone you haven't picked it up yet, we're here in Miami. We're loud and proud. Of it. I'm getting some good sun right now. My light over here is gone, but the sun's here. Um, Corey, you love your time in Miami, but you're doing even greater things with Chain Race. Talk to us. Oh, so, uh, hey, excited to be here. Thank you, Herwig, for the invite. So I got into this space from uh, my crazy co-founder. He was he caught me at a point in my life where I was just investing full time. I uh, exited a construction company early uh, before I went full time investing. And uh, he's like, hey, dude, you need to take a look at what this crowdfunding stuff is and you need to see the momentum behind it. That was my introduction into this space. And, you know, as I dug deeper, I realized that um entrepreneurship is going to change. And that's why I like to think about kind of my introduction into this whole space as a whole, because um, Chainraise is a pro entrepreneur company. That is really what we try to focus on is building tools. And crowdfunding is the ultimate um, leveling, um, leveling of the field to, you know, people who kind of grew up with the connections to fund their goals. I mean, that's really what it is, is crowdfunding gave the everyday entrepreneur, which I tend to think I am, didn't grow up with the connections in Wall Street or in Silicon Valley. And I looked at crowdfunding as a way for entrepreneurs who grew up in everyday cities like Phoenix, Arizona, where I come from before I moved to beautiful Miami. And it got me really excited. It, it, it showed me that this is a turning of the day where everyday entrepreneurs can leverage the power of the internet to raise capital. As we dug deeper, you started to realize that tokenization is a big part of that total equation. Because I always tell people it's easy for an entrepreneur to say, hey, give me money today. The harder question to say is, how do I get my money back? And then we realize kind of putting together the pieces of the puzzle, tokenization plus crowdfunding has the potential to change capital markets. I love that. I can't wait to dive more into that vision and, and what you're building there. We're going to head over to Caitlin. She's with Republic. I'm such an admirer of Republic as well, because for those of you who don't know, they are one of the top three, but maybe the, the largest uh, Reg CF platform in the world. Uh, that's an incredible a KPI, a stat to be proud of. Tell us, Caitlin, what should we know about you and Republic? Thank you for the intro. I'm super excited to be speaking on a, on a panel with all of you. 
really knowledgeable people in this space who are, are of course, pushing the limits here. Um, in terms of myself and Republic, you know, I started off in the more traditional venture space working for a growth fund um, and then joined Republic three and a half years ago. Um, and at the very beginning, really what we were most well known for was that crowdfunding platform, you know, running deals through Reg CF. And then later, as we opened up our broker dealer um, via Reg D, Reg S and Reg A as well. Um, you know, but what a lot of people don't necessarily know about Republic is that we have two other really amazing arms as well. We have a private capital arm um, that likes to invest in the deep tech and crypto space as well. Um, and then also our advisory services arm which focuses on bringing web to, or web two enterprises um, and helping them along their web three journey, whether that means bringing a token to market um, and helping them plan out that infrastructure and everything of that sort. Um, but really the way that we are thinking about tokenization as a crowdfunding platform um, is to really give investors a different uh, type of way to interact with traditional kind of equity assets that they've had before. So, you know, being able to have more liquidity through secondary trading um, and also just a different, more tangible way to hold um, and kind of interact with your investments. So on our end, you know, we've also started to open up security token offerings that we do on our platform utility token raises um, and Republic herself to have really dedicated to the mission um, by creating our own note, which actually is a token that allows for all no investors to get upside into the Republic portfolio um, specifically as well. So we're super bullish in the area um, and are excited to see kind of just like how investors adapt and um, adopt tokenization in, in this way. Absolutely. I'll put your money where your mouth is and making it happen. I love to see it. And the same goes for Joel. You helped co-found Rialto, one of the almost really end-to-end -end ecosystems, putting it all together. You guys have done a lot to be able to make that happen. One of the leaders in the Reg CS, especially for tokenization space. Tell us, tell us more about yourself and tell us about Rialto Markets. Well, uh, interestingly, I think I'm the old guy on this panel. Uh, but thrilled to uh, be here because uh, the vision is the same. Uh, I just came about it from a different angle. I, I, I am traditional, uh, unlike uh, what Corey said, I am traditional New York, born and bred, capital markets, Wall Street. Uh, but it didn't take much uh, several years ago to realize that that's not what's happening in the future. Uh, the, the new investors, the new generation, there's going to be trillions of dollars that are transferred to the next generation and the next generation trades differently. They invest differently. They invest with their feet. They invest with their hearts. They invest in things they care about and they want to control their investments. And uh, we work, you know, we work uh, with Republic. We work, work with a lot of these companies in there. We think that the groupings of our teams together and all the different visions that we have are really what's going to make this work because crowdfunding is a new way, not only for issuers to raise capital and be able to be entrepreneurial as necessary, but it's also a new way for investors to diversify their investments and participate in areas that until just a few years ago, they were not able to do. And to, to me and to us at Rialto, that's the most exciting thing. It's being able to take traditional capital markets to the next generation. And the next generation is not traditional. It may need to abide by much of the regulation. It may need to conform with some of the requirements, uh, but nonetheless, it needs to think a lot more uh, out of the box and a lot more innovatively in order to create wealth for the next generation and to create new businesses, new opportunities, and just new visions of in all different industries. And that's what we're most excited about. Yes, the, the term democratizing investing, I think, comes up. I, I completely agree with you. This whole panel, I think, is, is it right here when it comes to creating the new wave, the new generation of investing. And I want to stick with you a, a little bit, Joel, to, to go dive into the Rialto ecosystem. And you, know, you gave us a little bit of the vision. Talk to us about how you built out the ecosystem and how we can take advantage of the you know unique positioning Rialto has built. Yeah, so what we did, is we, we uh, are a, a FINRA broker dealer. Uh, we operate a, an alternative trading system for secondary trading as well. Uh, and what we did really was we, we focused on how to bring 
all of those uh, complexities and all the different parts of the ecosystem into one single place so that an individual investor can just go to go to do what they have to do, fill out whatever forms and be able to have the whole process. So if you think about it, there are so many component parts to make sure that an investment can actually be done, whether it's uh, escrow agents and transfer agents and payment rails and credit cards, ACHs, wire, whatever it might be, all the broker dealer requirements, we we decided that we're going to deliver the ecosystem for it. So the um, the example that I use is actually it's a sandwich. There's the bottom layer, which is the ecosystem and infrastructure necessary from an operational technological perspective. That's the bottom layer of bread. The top layer of bread is really the the oversight and vision of a, a regulated entity to make sure that everything is working in compliance with what it has to get done to protect investors. And then there's the meat in the middle. And whatever meat you bring to the middle, that's up to the issuer, that's up to the investor. We're providing the layers of bread and everyone else can bring in whatever they want, whether it's real estate, whether it's any ESG company, whether it's gaming, any kind of issuance that they might have they can bring in and take advantage of the entirety of the ecosystem with all the requirements of uh, legal, uh, financial payments, et cetera, and all the regulatory assurances of uh, anti-money laundering, know your customer requirements, advertising and doing all the things you're supposed to be doing the correct way. And that's really how we came about building the offering. And what we do is we offer not only to individual issuers, but also to enterprises. So you you might be an enterprise that offers this solution to 20 different properties in real estate or whatever that might be. You can take advantage and white label what we have in order to help those companies raise capital and in order to help those companies trade in the secondary market. Wow, incredible. And I know how much hard work has been behind the scenes in order to make that possible. I know Corey knows it firsthand too, uh, going through the process for for those of you who don't know, you know, a crowdfunding platform it can be a broker dealer, but it also can sometimes be its own form, a broker dealer light. They call that. Corey, tell us about your journey going through setting up chain raise and and how you dealt with all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So we are not a broker dealer. We are a licensed crowdfunding portal. So when we kind of took a step back and envision what online capital raising plus tokenization can look, look like, we said this needs to be an ecosystem. And then we drew that ecosystem out saying that the online capital raise is the first part of that ecosystem. So that's where we put it, uh, our initial focus and emphasis on is building out that rig CF platform, getting a license through FINRA, which of course allows companies to raise up to $5 million from both accredited and non-accredited investors. Um, in addition to that, um, the tokenization and cap table management software is being built out right now, which then gives the, um, the companies that are raising the capital the ability to manage their investors. And we built it like this on purpose, knowing that even for a company to be able to trade, it takes 12 months. So you need to get the companies in the pipeline first before you even build out any other parts of the tech if you want to be that full ecosystem. Um, Ideally, we do want to partner with a company on the ATS. I'm not ready to wear all the hats of being a broker dealer. I salute someone like Joel, who is, uh, I, you know, FINRA, God bless them. They are fantastic. They, you know, when we got into the space, a lot of people warned us about FINRA. I will say almost all of them have been completely wrong because FINRA has been a really great partner to us and has helped us work through whatever we need to, to be able to get licensed. And we really feel like we have a very collaborative relationship with them. With that being said, a rig CF portal is a fraction of the amount of compliance work than a broker dealer. But um, of course, we do look at ourselves as, a, as an ecosystem being built. Um, at the end of the day, I do think that ability for a company and for an investor to be able to not have to switch from one platform to another is extremely important because um, who keeps who, who wants to go through KYC all the time? 
No one does. It's it's a cumbersome process that investors are not excited about. It's one of those things that you have to do it. So the less that you have to do the ugly work, the better. Um, but the, the idea of being an ecosystem is what excites us. And the ability to also have that, um, that investor dashboard in the middle connecting that primary offering and that secondary market, I think is also really crucial too. Because that's where you get the ability to almost own probably not the 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 type of word I want to use but you kind of get the ability to own the investor's attention and the issuer's attention and I think that's really important in terms of building that relationship with both the company and the investor uh you know when when I take a bird's eye view of why this space is so impactful, I think it's because of the lack of data and clarity when we do private investments. I was uh, on the phone with one of my buddy's companies I invested into about a week or so ago, and I'm asking him, hey, like, you know, how's the company doing? How much capital have you guys raised? And then I get to the ugly question saying, like, so how much did I get diluted? First off, he didn't even know how much I got diluted off the top of his head because they've done they've done a handful of deals where they brought on some a uh, new CEO. They done two rounds of uh, of investing. He's like, I'll, I'll have to go check the spreadsheet. I was like, Oh my goodness! And but you know that that points to the importance of having that dashboard in the middle where you can be able to access that data as the investor without having to pick up the phone and go ask someone for this. Um, but yeah, so you know, getting that license as a kind of going back to the main question there, um, we we ended up getting licensed as a crowdfunding portal. And over time, we will build out that full ecosystem, um, ideally being a broker dealer, just kind of waiting until um, you know everything makes sense on paper, because it is a lot of work. Yeah, totally. And, and that's a similar story for most crowdfunding platforms that have come to market and, and props to everybody on this call. And Corey, there really aren't that many folks, not many people are willing to go through the work of getting that crowdfunding portal license, maintaining that or going the full kahuna with the broker dealers license. I think Republic is a perfect sort of scenario there of starting out that way. But now uh, I can't even count the number of acquisitions recently. Recently, we saw earlier this year a notable investment into INX. Please, Kaylin, shed some more light on, on the future of the platform of the Republic. Yeah, absolutely. I think that really a lot of the developments that have been made on the Republic side of things are really in the name of tokenization. Um, you know, so the investment we had made into INX earlier, you know, the ATS that we are really looking towards for being able to open up a secondaries camp. Uh, secondaries platform is very, very important to that all. And then we also revealed a few weeks ago as well, the Republic wallet. Um, it's a self-custodied wallet that is super easy to set up. Um, if you ever go through the flow, it really just takes a few minutes. Um, and we've created this because we want investors to have a really nice experience and flow um, from being able to invest while also becoming token holders at the same time too. You know, I think that so many companies are looking to move down the path of tokenization, but there aren't necessarily a lot of players in this space who have a coherent investor experience that really supports that. Um, so with the wallet, you know, being able to prompt investors to create a wallet within seconds while they're making their investment, being able to drop the token in there, um, and then opening up that secondaries exchange so they can actually trade and, and kind of liquidate that asset is something that we see as some of the main pillars of our investment platform um, you know, in the coming future. And it's something that we're really excited about. And so now it's really about getting a lot of our issuers on board, um, and then also just finding the people out there that are really looking to raise in this type of way um, and raising up education in the area as well. Um, you know, I think that there's always going to be investors who are really excited about a new technology, but then we also have a lot of our really amazing legacy investors, um, you know, who we want to be participating in these token raises, you know, in the same way uh, as well. So, you know, a lot of focus on, creating a nice and and cohesive experience in that sense. Oh, that makes makes total sense. And I think everybody watching is, is starting to see the vision come together about what, what it looks like for regular folks to be able to invest in opportunities that just never existed, not without you helping make that happen. Naturally, we're going to head over to Laura here. You're unique because you don't represent a crowdfunding portal here today, but you do play a very important role. So please uh, you know, give us a little bit more insight to what Upside does and, and how you work with public and, and others. 
Yeah. So let me start with, um, with upside and upside is a technology infrastructure, purely blockchain based. Uh, we have 28 brilliant minds on our team across nine countries. The company was founded by Noah Thorpe in 2016 as a venture studio. So Noah's background he worked for Google, he worked for Apple, he was the VP of engineering for NASDAQ, he and his team built out the tech stack for what's now um, NASDAQ private markets. Most recently, he was a CTO at Republic and developed Republic Crypto. Over the last eight years, Upside has tokenized upwards of 50 projects, successfully launched nearly 2 billion in tokens, um, security tokens, as well as utility tokens and deployed uh, on several blockchains, including Ethereum, Polygon, Algorand, and many of the other um, major chains. Um, with that, distributed over to over 1.5 million blockchain um, addresses, right? So really incredible what they've been doing. Over the last 12 months, uh, we've been hyper-focused on real estate securities and currently putting the finishing touch on a compliant marketplace platform specific for tokenized real estate where issuers and investors are going to come together. So wow. specific to real estate, yes. Um, you know, fun fun fact about uh, Upside, they in, in conjunction together with Republic launched the first tokenized offering under Rank CF. So really amazing things that they're doing. The team is brilliant. I'm so honored to be part of what, what's happening here. The, the first tokenized Reg CF and clearly upside critical infrastructure to yeah. power all folks is the behind the scenes stuff that then makes a lot of these things possible. Not It's the licenses, it's the technology, it's the blockchain, it's, it's all coming together. Uh, so I want to stick with you, Laura. I want you to give us some insight to what you believe, you know, it, the future holds for crowdfunding markets. What does 2024 look like? You're clearly knee deep in the challenges and helping create the infrastructure. So, you know, get us excited. What can we look forward to? Yeah. You know, I really feel like um, with, with what's happening with the CF and with tokenization in general, the idea that we're going to make the efficiency of, of investing in real estate, trophy assets, commercial assets, um, things like that, efficient democratizing, um, the ability for everyone really to do that right, U.S. investors, foreign investors, accredited investors, non-accredited investors. Um, CF allows the, uh, the almost, you know, it, it's it's also being used as, as kind of like a bootstrap to fund subsequent larger raises through like a reggae, for instance, right? Being able to um, raise capital and then um, not only, not only, launch under the CF, but under other, you know, subsequent crowdfunding type of, of raises as well. My, my vision and what I really love, love most about what's happening in the space for, for CF, and, and I'm, I'm really more focused on the real estate side, is that the social cause behind um, what we can do with, with the technology and with the regulation, right? The idea that, there's these really large developments um, that are out there and they're, they could be fully funded, right? But the idea that they're willing to offer a tokenized offering under a CF raise and, and allow for community participation, there's this massive social cause behind that that really contributes to the support of the community getting behind the real estate development, right? Or getting behind... Um, potentially living in a apartment building or, you know, uh, traveling to a hotel or, you know, all of these, all of these different aspects of it that for me, I think um, my driving reason and force behind it is truly to share and, and democratize this whole experience, uh, especially in real estate because of, you know, the history and how important that asset classes for investment and wealth and et cetera, et cetera. 
I, I think it's obvious to everybody how passionate you are about that. I think I can speak <laughs> for everybody that we all love that insight and that cause. You know, the social causes is a huge angle to all of tokenization. I think that's that's under talked about. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have too much time to, to go into further on that. I want to head over to Caitlin. What do you think in terms of the future of the market? Do you see, you know, the the number of Reg CF issuances exploding? Do you see a continuous slow, uh, you know, kind of growth or Organically, what do you think is going to be in store for 2024? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it's amazing because Reg CF only came about in 2016, really. So we've been able to track the story and get a good grasp of it thus far um, in, a, in a more intimate way. And so being able to track changes um, is very cool on that. I would say that historically, we've oftentimes known Reg CF as a security exemption that startups would take. You know, I think that. Um, you know, democratizing access to private companies in that way has been really amazing and something that excites, uh, you know, the investor base a lot. Um, but I think something that's really exciting that we're kind of moving into a second phase of, especially with the tokenization aspect coming into play, um, is the ability to fractionalize and invest into real world assets. Um, you know, it really does change the game because I think traditionally with startups, you have a much longer hold time, um, you know, you don't get that immediate liquidity and you also don't get that immediate like revenue as well because, um, you know, startups don't necessarily pay dividends, right? So, you know, it's a pretty long-term commitment that you have to make. Um, but now with the technology and tokenization and the different partners in the place, uh, in this space, uh, it makes it really easy for investors to get access to those projects that, you know, they will have liquidity in, um, you know, being able to liquidate their investment quite quickly. And then also at the same time, too, we'll be able to see revenue in the form of dividends and payouts pretty immediately. And so I think that because of it, it just gives investors with a, a much different risk profile, you know, finally an opportunity to play in a space and also allows for different types of diversification um, for non-accredited investors and because because of that, I think it's a really, really exciting application and kind of new phase that we're seeing with Reg CF. Uh, absolutely makes a lot of sense. The liquidity has obviously been a topic all day long. You're able to introduce that element. I completely agree. It just makes it you know, less risky or more affordable for people to actually participate when they don't have their money locked up permanently in, in some cases. Uh, Joel, do you agree with that? Do you think liquidity is that missing piece that might help unlock and, and really firepower crowdfunding markets? Or do you think it's something else? Give us your thoughts. Well, I, I definitely think it's something that can unlock the firepower, as you say, of, the, of those markets, um, but it's still not here. And it's going to take a little time to get here, and that's fine. We'll we'll work through it. But one of the key components of that liquidity is, uh, you know, I think Caitlin was touching upon this. You know, if you go back twenty years, the average time that a company stayed private was about four years. Uh, now it's a little more than thirteen years. So back then, twenty years ago, if you were investing in private securities uh, and you were looking for a liquidity event. The question you would always ask is, what's your exit strategy? And someone would say, well, I'm going public in four or five years. You can deal with that. Well, now they're saying I'm going public in 13 years. I have to pay college tuition in three, right? I'm looking to buy a, another home. I'm looking to whatever I'm looking to do, I'm going to need my money a lot quicker than that. So having control over your liquidity, over your exit strategy is so essential. And I think that is the key is to be able to control your own capabilities of getting some kind of liquidity. Now, there may not be any real liquidity out there, but at least you're not beholden to the other side. The, the markets themselves and the ability to re remember a dozen years ago, a whole bunch of people in the United States and across the world weren't even allowed to get involved in these regulatorily, they were prohibited from getting involved in these kinds of securities. So now they're getting involved in it. They're able to participate. Now they're also going to want to look to say, well, I don't want an exit strategy in 13 years. How do I get? Well, we're giving you control. It's empowering the investors. But what I want to touch on, one more thing that I want to touch on is a more grandiose picture of what it's going to look like. It's not just about Reg CF. It's about, as you started with, democratizing the market. How do we get retail involved in the market? 
Currently, alternative investments, I think it's a McKinsey study of last year, $11 trillion in inter- alternative investments. $220 billion of that is retail. 2% of the alternative market is from retail. That's a lot of potential to get retail involved. Reg CF is, is one of the ways to do that, getting people involved in funds that they could not touch before, alternative investments, real estate investments that they couldn't get involved in earlier. All of these things are opening up the entirety of the community and democratizing the markets for access. That's the key to this. Control and access. I think that's a fantastic insight. We need to let entrepreneurs know that this technology exists and it works. Uh, I totally agree. Corey, I want to ask you around a, a similar topic there around liquidity. You know, there was a thesis out there. I think I agree with it. You know, the more holders you have of your security, the more that will potentially impact liquidity, right? There are potentially more buyers, more sellers, more interest versus having, you know, say three investors locked up holding up your, your tokens because they're waiting till the end, right? So that's not going to help anybody. Do you agree with that? Tell us more about the role you think the crowd plays in this whole liquidity, you know, challenge. Yeah, so two things I want to touch on with that. Um, of course, for a secondary market transaction to occur, you need sellers and buyers, right? So sellers, the more people that own a token, the more potential that someone wakes up and says, hey, I want to sell today, right? Um, what I think is actually more the bigger thing that I want to put an emphasis on here, and I think this is for the whole space as a whole, is creating the desire for people to buy these assets. Because at the end of the day, we can build all this technology in the world, but if someone doesn't desire the the asset that is being offered, all this is for show. And, you know, so when I think about what I hope the future of digital capital raising and tokenization looks like is a heavy emphasis on good old digital marketing and crowd building. Because, you know, once again, if people don't want to invest, that is that that is what we need, right? And so one of the things that we really try to put an emphasis on with chain raising with our issuers is educating them on what it takes to build an audience instead of you know the you know reverse of that course, which is just showing up one day and say we have an offering. Um we you know, when, when I take a look out there, I think people are starting to understand that. And you see people that are kind of in this real estate space slash influencer, you know, they have the social media channels and presences. They're starting to realize that when they take that following that they built on Instagram, on YouTube, or anywhere else on the internet, and they reapply that towards investments and raising capital, it is extremely lucrative and that result can happen extremely quickly. But at the end of the day, though, that comes from building an audience, building trust, building conviction, and then asking them, hey, do you want to invest with me or a good company? A good company builds up trust with their with their customers and then they say, hey, listen, you love our products. Now, do you want to invest? There's no shortcut around that. At the end of the day, all the technology is smoke and mirrors around the ideas. Does someone want to invest? And that also continues into the secondary market. Because if you are an entrepreneur who wants to tokenize your company, you are effectively responsible for creating that demand in the secondary market. Whether that is through press releases, partnership announcements, acquisitions of other companies, reporting your growth and your revenue and your profitability or whatever it may be. It is ultimately your responsibility to create that demand in the secondary market. So when I look at what I hope the future of this space looks like as a whole is helping entrepreneurs understand you have to create leverage the power of the Internet to get people interested. But beyond that, you ultimately have to, um, you know, sometimes shake the hands, get on the phones, do whatever it takes to get people excited to be a shareholder. And there's no shortcut around that. I completely agree. There's absolutely no shortcut around that. I even think more companies that are already tokenized in space can take a, a page out of your advice here and do an even better job uh, of that. 
Uh, I want to do one more round, Robin, that we got time for here. I'll stick with you, Corey. Uh, and again, great insights from the panel. Desire, control, liquidity, social causes. It sounds like we got the recipe for unlocking crowdfunding markets. Awesome stuff. Corey, leave us with your favorite use case that you've seen of a regulation crowdfunding campaign can be a completed one or, or a live one. Obviously, none of this is investment advice. Everybody that's watching, this is just to highlight what everybody likes, what they see in the space. Yes, yeah, great question. You're going to put me on the spot here. Um, when it comes to one of my favorite use cases, I'm going to think about one that everyone can apply to and everyone can resonate with. And that is the local business that they frequent on a consistent basis and being able to enjoy extra perks for being a token holder of the said restaurant, whether that's preferred seating, whether that's some sort of discount or drinks or whatever it may be. But the ability for someone to actually gain a benefit uh, from something that they have invested into is a really nice benefit. And I'll tell you why that's so important. When you really think about why um, early stage investors typically invest into said company, it's usually because they're connected to that product from a personal reason. At least that's what I've seen from angel investors. They're investing into something that they want to use themselves. So to be able to help them have an, a, a written out incentive, something that is literally structured into kind of their rights as a shareholder is something really nice. And, um, you know, I think a restaurant is the most um, easy for everyone to understand type of incentive because who doesn't want to go to their local restaurant and get treated a little bit more special? I absolutely Totally agree. You know, benefits are what, you know, that's where crowdfunding started with, right? With Kickstarter, the idea that you're going to get something for backing it early. We got to marry the two. I want stock and I want benefits. You know, I think that's what makes people happy. Totally agree. Laura, you know, you mentioned social causes. Obviously, real estate is near and dear to your heart. Lots of great use cases there with offering hotel stays, benefits and discounts. Tell us an example of a company you've seen or a use case that you really love for regulation crowdfunding, maybe one that's utilizing the, the social causes side. Yeah, you know, I really feel like there's, you know, there are real estate developments out there, like I had mentioned earlier, that are large, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in in um, valuation, right? They're building huge resorts type type of offerings. And the idea that they would consider a CF offering to allow participation of the community or participation um, around that cause. These are eco, eco-friendly, eco right? Um, we have another that we're working on right now that's a surf resort. I mean, the idea that, that we're going to provide the opportunity for those who really love and, and are passionate about the cause um, to participate in the real estate development and the success of that real estate development is, I mean, I just think that's game changing. You know, you, you get the community to rally around you, you get the community to rally around the project, um, as opposed to, you know, what we see a lot in real estate development, a lot of opposition, a lot of uh, people in the neighborhood don't want that particular building to go up in that particular location. Um, so, you know, the idea that they can share in the success is, I mean, I just think that's game changing for the industry. I, I again, I could fi I find it hard to disagree with you. Uh, I think that's phenomenal insight, Joel. I'm going to head over to you. Uh, you can even cheat because I think you have a, a reg CF of your own. But you know, you're welcome to to call out any example you'd like. Yeah, actually, I'd I'd like to um, sort of take a a similar avenue that Laura took, um, but with a different industry or different a different concept. Um, there are many uh, private equity funds and a lot of the funds that um, retail investors have always read about that everyone's getting rich off of. Um, and now we're working with some funds that are democratizing. They're tokenizing their fund so that they can get from you know investments that were minimum of $250,000 to minimums of $2,500. Uh, because they've been tokenized and they've created this. And there's a lot of work, a lot of legal work that has to be done in order to make sure this, this happens. Uh, but when it happens, 
imagine, for example, we're working with a company that does the carbon credits. Uh, how do you get involved when you're a retail investor to really make money off of that kind of world? You have to be able to get involved in a fund that invests in a whole bunch of different things. Well, those funds are really pretty much closed to anyone who's only willing to invest even up to $10,000. You're not going to be able to get in. But here we're, we're tokenizing it. We're bringing it to the, to the retail segment. And now this entire fund market that really was designated for PE firms or hedge funds and all those things that retail investors have read about but have never been able to participate in is now being made available for their participation. Absolutely awesome use case. The institutional playground was always a, an institutional only club. Even private markets, maybe many argued were the accredited only club, right? It wasn't until Reg CF truly enabled this democratization. And now what you're saying is we're going to be able to jump right to the front of the line and, and get those institutional deals. I'm looking forward to that. Um, Caitlin, we're going to head over to you. I'm not going to let you use the Republic Note. I'll give a quick promo because I think the Republic Note is very cool uh, because it gives you a chance, and it, it did do a Reg CF, a chance for anybody to get exposure to the collection, the portfolio of companies that Republic has helped raise money for. So they actually have exposure to those companies directly. And through their note offering, you can get exposed to that whole basket. Super awesome use case. Love it. But you can't talk about it. Give us another one, Caitlin. Um, thank you for that shout out. And yeah, I think when I... I think the use case that I would probably choose is one that's pretty personal. You know, I've always been really interested in the music industry um, and we actually were able to do a music offering on our platform. Um, you know, we raised money for a pretty well-known rapper, Little Pump, his song on the platform. And I think that it was a really amazing use case, I think, both on the fan side, you know, where he was able to involve his top listeners, you know, people who wanted to be able to say that they owned a piece of a song made by one of their favorite artists and be able to see the economic upside of that. Um, you know, I think that that aspect of it does create a really amazing flywheel because you automatically have those champions that are going to be listening and streaming to the song or whatever release it is. Um, on the day it comes out, but also at the same time on the flip, um, you know, for artists, I think there are a lot of financing industries that are pretty dated. Um, you know, we've seen with the strikes that are going on with the Writers Guild, you know, I think there's a lot of unfair contracts that, you know, people within the creative industries will enter into. Um, and a lot of that has to do with funding and kind of the rights that they're giving up at the very beginning stages. And so I think that through crowdfunding, you know, being able to tap into, you know, someone's natural audience that they've garnered themselves over time and not necessarily having to um, rely on maybe more predatory labels or, you know, kind of producers that they may be working with um, really allows for, you know, both the artists and community to benefit um, in that way. And so I think that crowdfunding really does provide an opportunity and an avenue to shake up some pretty dated, you know, funding avenues and industries um, that have kind of been waiting for a change and, you know, have been wanting a change for a while now. Yeah, no, I love that use case. Uh, unlocking you know, specifically the music industry itself has its own issues and its sort of monopolies. Uh, so again, democratization there, I think, is an awesome awesome use case. Well, with that, folks, uh, we are out of time. I was hoping to maybe uh, get in a few questions. So for those of you who do have questions in the audience, I highly encourage you to reach out to our panelists here. And if you haven't put it together, we haven't been doing a very good job that you today, doesn't matter who you are, whether you're accredited or an institution or none of those things, there are great opportunities available for you to invest in. Many of them tokenized, chain raise, Republic, Rialto markets. That's where you got to go check out some of these amazing opportunities opportunities. Again, not investment advice, but just knowing how great you all individuals are, I'm sure it's the same for the deals on the platform. So again, thank you all so much for joining us. Appreciate your time. And we hope to catch you all on day two. Now let's head over to our closing statement for day one. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.